So welcome back everybody. This is Night Flight and today my guest is Joseph Edward. He studied Greek, Latin and uh, biblical studies in Japan and then in 1995. He was very um, infatuated with the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls and that meant he went back to studying um, yeah the sea, uh, sea scrolls and uh, the Bible. So, sorry about that. And yes. uh, I'm very happy to, <laughs> happy to have him here. So, Joseph Atwell, welcome to Night Flight. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Judith. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Um, so, what initially started your um, interest in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Can you recall what that sure. was? Sure, sure. Um, uh, I, uh, th there was a number of books that were out, uh, sort of books about the sensationalism of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, they were describing uh, secret scrolls that hadn't been released to the public. Um, there was a great number of them that uh, the Vatican and uh, other scholarship groups were keeping hidden. And so there was speculation about them. So these were just sort of books for common people. And they had uh, you know, a lot of speculation about what might be in these scrolls. And that led me to actually start reading the original scrolls, what were, was available. Um, at this time, Robert Eisenman, who became a colleague of mine, and I actually worked on papers with him, he um, was able to, to get all of the scrolls at a particular point in time. And he then released them. And it was really quite explosive because the scrolls that uh, had been hidden were very messianic. They were, you know, had, had a lot of the same proof texts that you'd see in the, uh, the gospels concerning uh, the Christology of Jesus Christ, you know, they, and there was one major difference of course, in that the scrolls were describing an organization that was militaristic and xenophobic and would be kind of the classic, uh, you know, Davidic messianic, you know, religious organization. They were, you know, just as David uh, had uh, fought against Goliath, you know, the uh, the people who were producing the Dead Sea Scrolls were very xenophobic, militaristic, and they were very much in opposition to the Romans. You could see they were they were fundamentalists. They wanted Rome out of their their uh, region, which they saw was something that was uh, the geography of uh, Israel was divinely ordained, of course, in their opinion, and so. Um, the question occurred to me uh, is that uh, how did the two groups, how did uh, the Jesus Christ pro-Roman group and this Messianic movement that was militaristic, how did they get along? <laughs> what was their relationship? And why in neither case does the literature mention the opposing, the opposing group? This just seemed absolutely inexplicable to me. I mean, you, you'd think in such a tiny area that there would be all sorts of, uh, uh, you know, interaction between them and positions they would take against one another. And so uh, in order to try to understand this, I started reading the individual who was the only real um, historian of the era that you can get any primary sources out of, and that's Josephus. He was, um, I won't go into his background, but it's absolutely fabulous uh, to use an expression. He had a, a very exhaustive, according to him, understanding of, of the era and the region and uh, the war between the Romans and the Jews. And um, in reading Josephus, I started noticing that there were strange connections into the Gospels, or at least I saw them. Um, some scholars had noticed them, and there had been a little bit of work done on you know, how stories in the Gospels seem to reappear in Josephus. And my first idea was that Josephus was mocking the Gospels, that he was aware of them, and he was putting these little subtle stories into his history as a way of mocking Christianity. Um, but <clears throat> then uh, I, I kept finding more and more connections between the Gospels and Josephus. And eventually <clears throat> I had, um, well, the, the major insight, which was that all of the parallels that I've been studying were occurring in the same sequence in both um, books. 
that the parallels that I were seeing, you know, between Josephus and uh, and the Gospels were occurring in a sequence. And the sequence was vast. It literally went throughout the entire story of Jesus. And at that point, I realized that I was looking at a, a designed genre. It was something that was deliberate. And I didn't really understand what it was, but I knew that I was dealing with something that had been intentionally created and that it was something that was new, uh, at least a New Testament scholarship. People hadn't noticed this. And I, um, you know, it's hard really to, because of, there's a, a lot to the theory, but um, just in general, I realized eventually that what was occurring was prefiguration typology to describe it. It was the gospels had been deliberately written in such a way that the ministry of Jesus Christ, his adult ministry, is a kind of prefiguration typology. This is a, a fancy religious expression, meaning that there are parallels between you know, divine people, which link them together in a kind of overall divine pattern. It, th this, this occurs in Hebraic literature fairly often. And so whoever had created the story of Jesus had intentionally created it with the idea of prefiguring that Jesus is the life of Jesus would prefigure the military campaign of Titus Flavius, this Roman general. He's the one who brought about the fulfillment of the prophecies that Jesus made. So he's very um, instrumental in a way in the history of Christianity, because when Jesus envisions the temple being destroyed and Jerusalem being encircled. I mean, these are military victories of this particular individual. So <clears throat> when you get to the, um, the part of the gospel wherein Jesus Christ talks about the future and he describes the Roman war that's going to come, um, he, is, he then talks about the individual he calls the son of man who's going to show up. They'll have this terrible event, all of these catastrophes will occur during his visitation. And, but he doesn't name the individual, even though he gives historical events that will occur, he only describes the individual as the son of man, which is a messianic title, occurs in the prophecy of Daniel. And, um, <clears throat> and so I realized that what the gospels are actually doing is they are uh, creating a little puzzle, a typologic prefiguration that creates the identity of the son of man. It gives you the un understanding that the son of man that Jesus is envisioning is actually this Roman Caesar, Titus Flavius, who is the individual who brought about all of the uh, fulfillment of all of, the, of Jesus's prophecies. And so the gospels um, are actually a kind of, um, uh, the literature of the imperial cult at this time the Roman Caesars were um, presenting their divinity as a political structure, and they had an enormous bureaucracy throughout the empire, which essentially was just dedicated to worshiping them as God. And so the Gospels are, in a way, just a, a literary representation of the Arch of Titus. The Arch of Titus is you know, stone structure. Uh, in, in Rome, it commemorates the victories of uh, Titus Flavius uh, over the Jews in the 66-73 war. And on it, you see events which are uh, basically uh, from the war that Jesus was envisioning. And on the, uh, on the uh, arch, you see uh, that <clears throat> Vespasian, Titus's father, is, is identified as uh, God the Father. And uh, Titus is identified as the son of God. And so this um, is the theological construction that you see in, in the Gospels. Um, it's, uh, uh, and so, you know, the Gospels are, that, and have functioned very well, of course, as religious literature, but are actually, um, you know, a kind of humor, uh, in fact, of uh, uh, a sarcasm of, uh, of the Roman Caesar's uh, you know, in which they simply are mocking the Jewish um, penchant, you know, for prophecy and showing that, look, you hear your prophecies and who, do, who shows up to fulfill them? It's the Roman Caesar. This is what uh, the, um, uh, 
uh, the Jews theology actually is is uh, is good for it. It just you know predicts the the truth, which is that uh, the Roman Caesar was the the God who came and did all these things. And then amazingly, <clears throat> in Josephus, the exact same theological position is presented. Um, Josephus says that the Old Testament is dead. There is a new covenant between God and the Romans. This was a cryptic way of talking about the New Testament. And that <clears throat> Josephus flatly says that the Jews' prophecies and visions, uh, the dynasty of Vespasian, the, you know, the God, the Father, the Son of God that are on the uh, Arch of Titus. So um, the, uh, <clears throat> in, in my book, I, I you know, go through the, uh, uh, the parallels, the, the way that the, the connection is developed and, you know, some of the parallels are very abstract. Uh, they take, you know, kind of a, a reasoning, puzzling through them to see the connections. Uh, and other, others are just absolutely verbatim, are, are close to it. Um, and many scholars have written about them. But what they didn't do was to uh, recognize that there was a, a vast sequence. Individual scholars would write about individual parallels, but no one had ever bothered to link all of these parallels between uh, the Gospels and Josephus into an overall pattern so that you can stand back from it and just say, wait a second, uh, we're dealing with a, you know, a construction. It's deliberate. These aren't just unusual patterns or shared literary you know, ideas that may, one, you know, from some other source that ended up in Josephus and the Gospels. No, no, this is a deliberate uh, and overall uh, construction of the Gospels. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I looked up uh, the word uh, Evangelion, the Greek word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of people point out that it has military con uh, connotations. Yeah. And I that is uh, not very well known by anyone. Right. The, um, the Greek in the New Testament is a world unto itself. And um, there are, are many passages where militarisms, you know, Greek words that are actually relating to sort of military activity, uh, for some reason slip into stories that Jesus is describing. Um, and all of them are actually sort of what has been called technical terms of the imperial cult. So the imperial cult had developed its own sort of spiritual language, you know, of describing the divinity of Caesar. And a lot of these words end up in the gospels. This is something that scholars have written about and known about. Um, Evangelicon is um, good news is how it is normally translated. But in a religious context, it would mean uh, good news of a military success of Caesar. I mean, that's that's how the term is used in in the um, uh, in in the in the imperial cult. It has to do with uh, a over a, an overall victory by Caesar. And so, since the other terms are being used accurately, you know, in other words. The, the, the technical terms in the imperial of the imperial cult that appear in the Gospels are being used very precisely. They're being used in the same way, describing Jesus as they were used to describe the divinity of the various Caesars in the imperial cult. So you have to assume that uh, Gospel, Evangelicon, is also used just as precisely, which would mean that um, you're talking about the good news of a military victory. That's what you really are saying with the Gospels. And of course, when you look at it in that light, then the uh, the humor that I'm suggesting is is you know part of the Roman literature, part of the Roman construction of the Gospels. It just comes right through. You can see that um, that really what Jesus is proclaiming with his very life and with his prophecies is the good news about a Roman Caesar's military victory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that is something that has puzzled me for decades, that in all our so-called holy books, there is one subject that is really, really uh, prevalent, and that is war. Uh, yeah, it's odd, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it, it be, be it the Quran, the Bible, be it the Bhagavad Gita, what have you, 
that is the one subject that is always going on. And um, yeah. It, it, well, I, I, I feel that it's uh, because the religious literature is propaganda. In other words, um, the, the real purpose for the creation of, of, of the Abrahamic tradition religious literature is to uh, influence the followers of, of an oligarch um, to either obey or to fight. And so the stories are, you know, God is saying, you know, if you are pure, I'll, I'll knock down the walls and you can conquer. And, and then if you fail, then the reason is you were impure. And therefore you have to it is your problem, and and but in any case, it is not the the fault of the leader, the ruler, um, you know. So it's, I, I I just look at in general, and of course there are exceptions, but just in general, to to you know to your point, I just see the first thing I look at is just the um, the way that literature works uh, to um, to basically benefit the oligarchs, you know. How how is the literature? Because you can assume that in every case, in all of the Abrahamic traditions, um, that there had to have been, in order to produce the literature, to get it written, copied, put into circulation, there has to be a lot of money involved. So you can assume that there's, you know, political power uh, that is uh, accepting and promoting that has to be part of that. And so how does the literature benefit them? Well, in Christianity, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, you're just told to obey the magistrates. Uh, obviously, you know, the, uh, the Torah is the exact same, you know, structure. You, you, you're, you know, the, between you and God is the king. You know, David is the one that has the, the special relationship, you know, um, not the people who are like walking into the, you know, the military battles. But uh, anyway, uh, and of course, Muhammad has the same thing. I mean, he has the special relationship with God. And so... Um, when you're given advice to go to war, um, you are often just benefiting, you know, you're just, you're just reading literature that is encouraging you to, uh, to obey. Um, and I think that's, that's, you know, that unfortunately is why, one of the reasons why our religions are so uh, uh, catastrophically um, inept at keeping us out of war is because at the onset, uh, you know, they were there, you know, subtly to promote, um, you know, faith and uh, obedience and, and militarism, you know. And so they still do, the, the, you know, they, they still continue to produce the same result. Um, I, I would love to see us start over and uh, get rid of the, you know, historical religious literature, all of it, every single word. And... Um, for some of actually, there's some of Buddhism. I think you know is is kind of seems to be reasonable, but even there, you know, I, I would there's some of it. I think would would be good to rewrite. But in any case, in general, just get rid of it and uh, start over. I mean, we're a, as a as a being, uh, you know, humanity. We need spirituality. It's, it's part of us, um, but it's also something that's so easy to manipulate, and mm -hmm. that's why the the religions of the past you have the manipulation of our spirituality and it's led to our current situation, which is, you know, dire. Um, so uh, going forward, I would like, would be, it's a fantasy, but it's something I think is a reasonable goal for the future is to recover, you know, from the, uh, uh, the religious literature that, that uh, was so destructive and try to produce a new philosophy. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. So we will circle back to Caesar's Messiah, definitely. But sure. because we are uh, yeah, living in very interesting times right now, yeah. I, um, I would like to ask, do you have any idea why that is that the three Abrahamic religions cannot get along at all? Um, no, I mean... The the, um, the the reason they can't get along is because the current uh, oligarchic class uh, derives benefit from the conflict, um, mm -hmm. and so the public we we just are uh, left with our own ability to analyze um, to try to determine you know well what what exactly is the motivation you know what is in back of the current situation in Gaza. 
911, you know, was another good example. Um, World War II, World War I. I mean, what in the heck was going on in back of those things? Um, and of course, the, the basic problem is, is the first thing the oligarch gains control over is the media. I mean, this is, of course, just part and parcel. You have to recognize that, that all of the major, um, you know, media outlets are pr basically propaganda. I mean, there will be moments where they tell the truth about things, but in general, uh, they are there to, you know, to create a you know, kind of, they use the expression narrative, but it's just social control propaganda. So, um, you know, they, they get uh, to, uh, to get at our minds using the media. Um, the internet is, is obviously, you know, a, a force against that. Uh, now, of course, they're trying to control it. They have a lot of technology to do that. But nevertheless, it's the very first time where people can get together and exchange information, you know, that is not filtered through the oligarch. I mean, our discussion here is, you know, wouldn't be possible, you know, 100 years ago. Um, and, you know, looking at the degree of skepticism now that is uh, in the public concerning the media, um, there has been a tremendous transformation since 911. Uh, before 911, I, I don't have the exact data, but I'm sure over 90% of the American public would have trusted the American media. They would have trusted it to be, they wouldn't have agreed with it, but they would have at least seen it as trying its best, you know, in a general mm -hmm. sense to bring the truth. Now it is a vast majority do not trust it and prefer to get information from other, other sources. So there has been an enormous transformation. And I would also note that uh, with COVID and the mandates and the lockdowns, uh, it was another ratcheting up of the skepticism. Um, so many people saw this as, uh, uh, you know, social control and not as, you know, medicine. And, and that has also created to this uh, skepticism, you know, about, about government. Um, and I, I just think that, um, you know, to get to the point where the religions are not affecting us and making us vulnerable to uh, warfare, um, we need to have 100% almost of skepticism. And uh, also, the, the public needs to think better. Um, if I was to give advice, I would just say what we need to replace religious faith with, it would be the Socratic method which is just basically facts and reason, you know, that, that we, we don't ever accept anything on, on the grounds of authority, but rather just we are able to think through the phenomena and come to our own um, understanding of it. Uh, with 911, you know, you have the government's description of what happened, right? The Arab terrorists, the, the planes, and then suddenly you come to Building 7, and you have a you know steel frame building that is on fire, but no plane has struck it, and it collapses symmetrically and at free fall speed. Well, okay, I mean no no steel frame building has ever collapsed from fire before. Uh, no no building that wasn't used wasn't brought down by controlled demolition has ever collapsed symmetrically before, and no building that wasn't brought down by controlled demolition has ever collapsed at free fall speed before. So you have these three obvious phenomena that are right in your face. The videos are there. The, the thing was photographed from five different angles so you can, everyone can see that these are, these are correct assertions. And you just have to use the, you know, the method of logic and just go, well, one of these aspects would be suspicious, but to three occur at the same time, it's impossible to have been accidental. So now you have the, just a, a it, this is a, clear assertion of you know of, of government intrusion into this phenomena then like like the president of the united states coming out in a press conference and stating the fact you know i mean this is really just complete clarity so now you have this real problem because there is something that is evil and hidden inside our governments and, and inside our media i mean it's just right in our face when you see the collapse of building seven it is right in our face the government, there's something that is evil. It is um, because it will kill people, obviously, and it is secret. Now, it is in all of our governments. 
you know, you couldn't have pulled off 911 without um, uh, without there being, you know, cooperation of some kind among the governments, Western world governments, and 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 the media. Um, I, you know, because I'm a Bible scholar, I was very troubled by the date 911, which is something that people haven't discussed much, but. Um, reading Caesar's Messiah, you'll understand why for me it was troubling, is that um, in, uh, in, in the Jewish historical tradition, uh, uh, Tisha B'Av is um, the, the 911 date is the date that the temples were destroyed. The temples were destroyed on two occasions. Um, the second one is the one that I described in Caesar's Messiah, which was destroyed on the same day uh, the, you know, 911. And the, the, it's a little complicated because they have different, you know, months and things, but it's represented 911. Um, that would be the day that, uh, that the Romans claim that the Jewish temple uh, collapsed. Okay, so they claim that it collapsed on the same day cal in the in calendar month of the first temple's destruction. So you have the two destructions of the temples like 400 years apart, but it's on the same day. And the Romans claim that this shows the hand of God, it's divine intervention. Now, this then was very troubling when you have 911 occur, you know, in 2001, um, because, you know, I noticed two facts immediately. I mean, one is it would be on the first year of the third millennium. You know, you've had 2000 years and now to beginning the, the third millennium you you have on that first year of uh, the 911 date. So this this struck me as not circumstantial, very suspicious. And then I also was aware that one of the 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 building that I talk about, the symmetrical collapse, it's called the, the Solomon building, which would be a kind of euphemism or you know way of describing the temple built by Solomon. You see, the Solomon buildings collapse on the first, and so this would be the third basically Solomon building collapse on this date. And um, I just thought that was, uh, you know, needed a little more sunlight on it and no one would discuss it. In fact, very few people even aware of it. Um, but I always mention it, that it's something that really needs to be looked at. I'm not sure how much, you know, kind of facts people can get by studying that, but it's something you need to be aware of that it's just very, very uh, suspicious and unlikely that that date would be the day that the Solomon building would collapse in that way. I, I don't think it's accidental. I think that's ridiculous. I think this is, this is by design. And um, I think it's basically a kind of revenge um, by some oligarchic group that is aligned with, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, they see themselves as having some connection to, uh, uh, the Israelites, and so they they arrange the the date and the uh, destruction of the Solomon Building, and um, that would be how I would understand it. You know, I mean, I can't prove it, of course. I mean, but this would just be the analytic uh, understanding I have of the event. You know, it's part of the skepticism, you know, that I was talking about that that has developed since nine one one because it's not just the that particular aspect. There are dozens of other things which are inexplicable and yeah and um, sure. uh, it is it yeah. is also the ancient egyptian new year oh well there you go yeah interesting yeah so you can see that they they, they and this of course you know you get into freemasonry the um uh, you know is one of the things that you have to wonder about uh it's uh um you know you have the situation now in gaza uh which um you know, you, you've had this long process by which uh, the Palestinians have had their territory reduced. Um, and, uh, you know, people think of Zionism as a, you know, a, as a as a Jewish phenomena. Uh, and of course, in some ways of looking at it, it is. However, it wasn't really Jews that who, who started it and promoted it. And certainly it wasn't Jews that led to the creation of the Balfour um, Declaration, which is what really created the political power of the establishment of the State of Israel. Um, Zionism began in 1840 with Lord Palmerston, 
Uh, he was a British prime minister and grand master Freemason. And he said <clears throat> that now, 1840, is the time for the Jews to return to their Holy Land. And this was just a completely inexplicable statement. No one had, why, why are you having, where did this insight come from? <clears throat> the Jews of the era recorded that they were just shocked. They, that one of the expressions is that it was news to the Jews, that, that we didn't know we were now supposed to leave Europe, which was, um, you know, the uh, kind of anti-Semitism was waning and many laws are being created that were integrating Jews. And there was a lot of integration between Jews and, and Europeans at, at, at this point, when suddenly uh, Palmerston said, now is the time. Um, and uh, then from there, you have uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, Freemason and British royal family, um, you know, promotion of surveys, and books about uh, um, the return of the Jews. You start, they started creating a whole ethos. Uh, they brought mil they brought troops into into the area. Uh, the Rothschild family uh, bought the Suez Canal. So suddenly, from 1840 on, you had just this constant British influence in the region. Um, then you um, eventually have the character Herzl, who mm -hmm. was. 100% creation of this this clique. He comes right out of it. His his code name Tancred, he took from one of Disraeli's books. So he was he was certainly a, can be seen as a a creation of the uh, uh, British Freemason circle. And they actually created some of his speeches. So from there, you you the Zionism is uh, passed over to uh, almost exclusively to. Uh, uh, Jews who now take up the the cause in a way they weren't doing in the 19th century, and uh, this leads to our current moment here with uh, Gaza. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it appears to me that you know this is um, a kind of historical vengeance, wherein um, you know uh, one group wants to basically rework the the war of the first century, where um, the Jews were given the diaspora, driven out of Israel. Um, and so now this is, you know, with the third millennium and 911, it's all, it's all being reworked. Um, but, you know, and so you, you can, you know, you can look at this in, in different ways. I mean, certainly, you know, this longstanding sympathy for the diaspora of the Jews. However, <clears throat> I would um, note the rights of humanity of the Palestinians were not taken into consideration uh, by the people who wanted to bring about this historical uh, recapitulation. And um, I would also say that it's evil and it has to be done in secret. The thing that identifies the real moral issue here is the fact that it has to be done in secret. I am a huge believer in disclosure. I, I just think that you know, if you can't talk about it, if you if you can't answer questions about it, if you have to hide it from people, then it shouldn't exist. It just isn't, yeah. you know. So that's um, that's my sad understanding of our present moment is that it's it's just all under this um, system of secrecy. Mm -hmm. You already mm -hmm. mentioned the Roman imperial cult. What yeah. is exactly and why is it important <clears throat> well um it was a religion that worshiped caesar caesar was simply made into god um after julius caesar became dictator um you started having him portrayed as divine during mm -hmm. the republic era you couldn't get away with this but once you you had the caesars the emperors and the imperial families um, suddenly on coins and in, you know, statues, you started seeing all of these terms indicating that there was a divinity to Caesar. And in fact, Julius Caesar was um, deified. He was actually made after the fact that he was deified that he was a god. Now, this had an enormous uh, political value because if you are a god, then, well, you're taken more seriously, you know. And, um, and so... Uh, 
the the cult then grew and it became eventually the largest uh, bureaucracy in the empire. I mean, there were hundreds and hundreds of of priests whose only job was to promote the divinity of Caesar and they had temples all over the place. If you drive around Rome today, you'll see the um, you know artifacts of the imperial cult everywhere. There is just all of these things, even like the Colosseum is uh, is created as a, a structure of a Caesar's divinity. You know, it's, it was created as something to to worship the divine Vespasian, the god, the father of Titus. So, so the imperial cult was empire wide. It was for mind control, right? That's it's there to to keep the the population bamboozled with this idea of divinity of the Caesar, um, and it had tremendous. It had so it had a lot of political power now. Oddly, there isn't any evidence that anyone took it seriously. <laughs> I mean, there's no evidence of like spontaneous worship of Caesar. I, there are, I think there are actually a few examples, but very, very rare. So it was just uh, a kind of a way to, uh, to ratchet up, to make more powerful the honoring of the Caesar that the population had. Instead of calling him, you know, a great military leader, suddenly that wasn't good enough. You had to refer to him as God. And many of the Caesars, they, that was how you addressed them. Um, Domitian, Titus's brother, I mean, you had to call him Lord God. That was just how you would, how you would, uh, how you would address him. Nero, um, you know, he would come into rooms and there would be choirs who were trained and singing songs that described him as a divine being. So there was a a kind of a decadence and, and almost an absurdity that associated itself with the Caesars once it got out of the Republic era. You know, this, this, it lasted, of course, for hundreds of years, but um, it really, uh, they lost their way, you know, spiritually and mentally. Um, and they, you know, there was, I guess, a seduction to seeing yourself as a God. And, um, and so, this, the imperial cult is oddly enough, it's really, in my mind, is really how you can understand Christianity. If you don't, if you don't see Christianity as part of it, uh, then you, you just have a, you, you don't really understand Christianity. You don't understand the gospels. Um, the, the gospels are really, you know, like, as you said about the term gospels, they are just a way to, um, uh, you know, prophesize the divinity of Caesar and then create from that uh, the obedience that the Apostle Paul states that, you know, we're all here in our place. God put us in our place. It is wrong to rebel against our place. And um, you should obey the magistrates because God put them there as well. Um, you know, there, there was like a philosophy that Christianity has basically borrowed these ideas from, you know, Stoicism, where Seneca would write about, you know, I have money, but I'm really not any happier um, than a person who's a slave. And it, happiness really comes from, uh, you know, the acceptance of your role and your place. Then you can be truly happy because you're not rebelling against your life. Now, this was easy for him to say because he had 10,000 slaves, you see. So when you look at Stoicism, you're just looking at a kind of bamboozling. It's a way the oligarchs are able to control common people. Christianity is, is part of that. You see. Mm -hmm. When we look at uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it gives the impression of eyewitness account. Yeah. Um, at, meaning you read it and you have no additional information about right. that. So now, um, but the general consensus is that the Gospels were written between 80, 80 and 110 uh, CE, give or take yeah. five, 10 yeah. years. So, um, yeah, well, <laughs> if then let's say he, they were very young. Let's say they were 20. I, I can't see a teenager during that time 
following around uh, a uh, a Jesus character. No. Yeah, then they they would have been ninety hundred. Yeah. So they weren't really written by witnesses. Um, yeah. They were written well after the fact. Let me give you a, an easy way to date them. Um, at least you can see where the the final time when they, the Gospels could have been started. Um, now, Jesus Christ is the human Passover lamb of the new covenant. I don't know if you're, in other words, he's set up as a human Passover lamb. You know, they, they go through the symbolism of the, of, of, a, of the creation of a Passover lamb. They touch him with hyssop. They don't break his bones. These are instructions for the, how you prepare the feast of the Passover lamb. So he's definitely established as the new Passover lamb. All right. And of course, this is the new covenant, replacing the old covenant. So what they do with Jesus Christ is they have the, as they mirror the old covenant, there are, there are hundreds of examples of this, but they, they, they use the old covenant in many ways to, to structure the new covenant, the, the new Testament, because Testament is just a, another word for covenant. That's what it means. Um, so they they can they have a way that you can date the um, uh, the death of Jesus Christ. It's a little complicated. I won't explain it, but it's they they uh, they realize that the authors are trying to tell you that the Passover occurred on seventy three CE. This is when it occurred. This is when Jesus was crucified on uh, Passover seventy three at uh, thirty three CE. Okay, so this is. This is how the human Passover lamb of the new covenant uh, was slaughtered and had his, uh, his, his crucifixion on the Passover of 33. So if, you, if in the first covenant, you had the 40 years of wandering, and then after 40 years, you, you know, the Israelites were permitted into the promised land. They now own Judea, okay, so they could go in. 40 years, that's the, that's the period of time. So the gospel writers, then they go back in time to create their fictional character and they create the, his, the conclusion of his life, the crucifixion and date it to 33. Now, why did they pick that date? Well, it's because they back calculated it. The Roman Jewish war concluded with the fall of Masada on Passover 73, you see. So this is actually the day that Christianity is dated from. It's not the birth of Jesus. It's from the fall of Masada because that was the day that Rome controlled, owned all of Judea. So in the first covenant, after 40 years, the Israelites were given Judea. And in the new covenant, 40 years to the day uh, after, um, <laughs> I'm glad my cat's not around <laughs> 40 years to the day after the crucifixion, you have the Rome um, receiving ownership of Judea. So this is, this is how you can be sure that, um, you know, the Christian gospels were written following the war because this, this perfect 40-year um, mirror of, uh, couldn't occur accidentally. Uh, actually, they even... Uh, people wonder why you have um, the Pentecost, which is in, you know, Acts, they talk about the, and that's just mirroring uh, the first uh, covenant where the Pentecost occurred after the Passover lamb. And so they put that in there just as a marker to show that they're in the, in the temporal sequence, you know, that was established in the first covenant. So that was, you know, how the Jesus's death was established. And then even how his birth was established, it's all this back calculated and it's not really that hard to understand once you, once you see it. What's the name of your cat? Uh, Eva. Eva. Yeah. I have a cat. My, my cat may, may appear. It'd be funny if the cat shows up, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she always has to show up. She always yeah. wants to be part of the show, but of course, I of course. Her and in a couple of minutes, she will lose interest in that. No, it's with mine. Sometimes my cat will come up and sit in my lap, but it doesn't like these kind of things because it wants to talk. It, it feels that it, it went, after you talk and I talk, it should talk. And so yeah. we'd have, we'd have, <laughs> it's sort of hard to, 
keep track of it, you know. So. Yeah. So, um, okay. So now we have the hum the human Passover. Yeah. And um, I have to say, I'm not a fan of blood sacrifice, it be it uh, animal yeah. or human. No, me neither. Me neither. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. And um, but what what also is um, very irritating is uh, his date of birth. Yeah, twenty fifth of December. Yes, the Romans uh, celebrated the Saturnalia. So, right. uh, and even mathematically, it doesn't make any sense. It says that Jesus started, um, yeah, his uh, mission at the age of thirty, and then he taught for three and a half years, and then he was executed. Right. And that is in spring, depending where the full moon is. Yep. Maybe March or April. So if you are 33 and a half and you are executed during springtime, there is no way that you could have been born on the 25th of December. That's nonsense. Right. The 25th is um, not a number given in the Gospels. It, yeah. it became a tradition, um, and it is not clear how it became a tradition. Uh, people have suggested that it was simply borrowed from prior religions. But mm. it, isn't, it isn't given um, in, in the Gospels. Uh, actually, you can calculate that basically you know, using the prophecies of Daniel as to when he was born, What, you know, there is, when would 30 years have been you know, using the Passover at 33? And you can then go exactly back and, and you can come up with a day. That, that would be one way of doing it. But they don't, um, the authors of the Gospels aren't interested that much in his, the date of his birth. It's the date of his death that they're using in their typology. The date of his birth is is really not, they're not that interested in it. They're very interested in the date of his death because they're using that to establish the new covenant. In fact, the reason that it's, it's sort of uh, telling that, you know, his birth date is not precisely is not given. It just shows you what the authors are actually interested in. And that is his death because that they, they're interested in him as a human Passover lamb and they want to set up their 40 year cycle which will then lead directly to the military victory. Because remember, this is the gospel. This is good news of military victory. So they want his death to link up typologically to the ultimate Roman victory, which would have been you know, the fall of Masada and then the ownership of all of Judea. Mm, yeah. So the 40-year cycle, um, you mentioned already um, Jesus in the wilderness uh, for 40 days. Yeah, uh, the Israelites walking through the desert for 40 years. So where do we find this 40 years cycle? Well, um, the um, uh, 40 years is the is the time that in the Exodus is, uh, you know, the, the Israelites were basically made to wander in, in the wilderness. Um, uh, you know, and because they had uh, challenged God. And so 40 years is a period of penance in the Israelite religion. And so they had to be, you know, for 40 years, they were kept in the wilderness and then they could go into Judea. Um, Moses, of course, because he, he had doubted, he, he wasn't even permitted to go in. He had to stay on, on the sidelines. So it's all about penance and the, the nature of punishment inside the uh, Israelite religion. That's That's kind of where the 40 years comes from. Um, the Romans are mocking this. Um, they're, they're saying that, you know, the Jews are being punished for the rebellion, basically, against the Roman Empire. And so this is where, why they're using that mirror. But, but honestly, they're just, they're just taking the Jewish literature and then creating a kind of cartoon out of it. You see what I mean there? They take the elements, they they use them to overlay their military campaign and to back calculate when they're the Messiah, Jesus Christ prophesies these military victories. 
And then they insert a lot of things inside of the Gospels that are actually looking precisely at military victories. Um, so it's, uh, uh, you know, it's sad because there, there's been a lot of, of, you know, kind of speculation about where the ideas might come from. And a lot of people see, see very deep spiritual backgrounds for some of the ideas in the Gospels. You know, they, and, but I think these are more um, uh, just, uh, you know, these are just hoped for connections. You know, they, they aren't really very clear cut because the the real foundation is uh, is a military you know battle a war and that's that I think is is really the the deep level unfortunately of the gospels it's kind of a sad thing because so many people have had you know they see astro theology and you know ancient religious secrets and mysteries and I'm not to say that the Romans wouldn't have inserted some of that in they might have. But unfortunately, the real foundation of, of the religion is just the, the military victory that the, the Gospels are proclaiming is just this particular war, which even in itself is the dates are, are fictional. Um, the war is claimed, it claims it lasts for seven years uh, because it's mirroring the seven year cycle of Daniel. And in the middle of, of the war, um, you have the, um, uh, the fall of the temple and the abomination of desolation. Now, Daniel predicted it would occur at the midpoint of a week. And Josephus, the historian, uh, records that amazingly, um, just like the temple collapsed on 911, incredibly, the... Um, uh, uh, the abomination of desolation that Daniel predicted occurs exactly at the midpoint of the week at three and a half years. And then three and a half years from that, you have the fall of Masada. So you can see how nice and tidy the Roman authors, you know, created the dates where they, they, they made, they gave the war a seven year time span to mirror what's called a week by Daniel, which is a seven year span and then put the abomination of desolation, which Daniel predicted would occur in the midpoint. They, they gave that at exactly three and a half. Well, at, at, at a way it, you can determine it being halfway through the seven year period. And then they conclude the war uh, three and a half years from the abomination of desolation. So you have this very tidy theological temporal construction that uh, the Roman authors inserted into the gospels and unfortunately, uh, it's based on war. You know, we were talking earlier about uh, when could we might be able to recover well from from the literature. Well, we aren't going to recover if if you know the the foundation of Christianity is a uh, cryptic way of of uh, worshiping warfare. This was the public hour for full access of the entire interview please join our Patreon community. Thank you.